Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Craig Dubinsky and we are at Enola First Church of God in Enola, Pennsylvania. And we are out here on this nice, crisp, cold evening uh, of 22 degrees. So if you're sitting at home watching this or watching this on YouTube, you're probably a lot warmer than we are. But we're glad that you're with us online and on YouTube. Tonight we are in Revelation chapter 7, and we're looking at Bible study number 5. It's my goal tonight to finish this Bible study so that next week we can begin again with Bible study number 6, which will be the beginning of the next new section, which will be on the trumpet judgments. Remember, we were talking about seals, trumpets, and bowls, STB, not STP, the razor's edge, but STB, and we'll pick that up next week, Lord willing. Let's begin this Bible study with a word of prayer. God, we thank you that you have written the word of God and preserved it for thousands and thousands of years, and we have your word in our laps, on our tables, right here in our hands, as well as on our phones and our tablets and computers. You have done a tremendous job of writing truth for us and preserving it all of these years. Thank you so much. Help us tonight to learn something new or understand something better so that we will have a better grasp of your unfolding plan of redemption as you are working in, with, and through men and women, boys and girls around the globe, offering the gift of salvation through faith in Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this Bible study. Strengthen us now and illuminate our hearts and open our eyes in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I am on page three. I'm in the middle of the page. And I'm opening up my Bible to Revelation 7. And I'm going to read verses 9 to 12. Excuse me. Yes, 9 to 12. I'm going to read 9 to 12 first. And then we'll begin with the notes in the middle of your page. Revelation 7 and verse 9. I'm reading from the ESV Study Bible. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And in verse 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and honor, and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So, on your sheet, you'll see I have a great multitude. John MacArthur says in his study guide on Revelation, I'm going to read his thought on this first, he says, while the tribulation period will be a time of judgment, it will also be a time of unprecedented redemption. And we are beginning to see that. We've already seen the work of the Holy Spirit in calling and sealing the 144,000, which we've already covered. And now we see this great multitude of heaven declaring the glorious salvation in the tribulation period. Now keep your finger there and turn over to Isaiah 11. We're going to go back and forth between the Old and New Testament because one of the principles of biblical interpretation is that Scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to mm -hmm. see what Isaiah 11 has to say. And we're going to read verse 10. And if you'll turn there, Isaiah chapter 11. 
and verse 10. Isaiah 11.10 says, In that day, the root of Jesse... By the way, who is the root of Jesse? Who's that talking about biblically? Jesus. Jesus. Well, ultimately it's talking about Jesus, but before that, we're in the Old Testament. The root of Jesse is who? It's a man. It's who Pastor Sandy and I are going to be teaching about. Who is it? It's David. David. It's King David. Okay, remember the genealogy and the succession. Okay, Jesse was the father. Mm. David was the son. Okay, and Dan's answer, Jesus Christ is correct too, because that's the ultimate fulfillment. That's the fulfillment that will come later, but it's all in succession. So in that day, the root of Jesse, which is David, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. By the way, when did he stand for the signal for the peoples? When was Jerusalem established as the, as the capital of Israel? 1000 BC was the date, just about 1000 BC. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. The footnote on that from the ESV Study Bible footnote says, Paul quotes this verse in Romans 15, 12 to describe his ambition to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. He sees himself as living in the messianic time or the time of the Messiah, the Old Testament expected in which the Gentiles would come to know the true God and thus be his own ministry involved in spreading Messiah's rule among the Gentiles. So let's uh, look at Paul. Let's look at Romans 15. You can learn a great deal about biblical interpretation as you study how the Bible writers in the New Testament use the Old Testament. We're in Romans chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 13. Romans chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 13. This passage in this part of scripture is talking about Jesus Christ as the hope, the only hope, and the ultimate hope, and the eternal hope of Jews and Gentiles alike. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So you know the circumcised is the Jews, and you know the patriarchs are the Old Testament leaders it's talking about. And verse 9 and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Now, I don't know how your Bible is arranged, but the ESV study Bible has the next several passages as four paragraphs because there are four quotes. And it's four passages of scripture that Paul was going to quote. And when I get done reading, I'll give them all to you. You can write them down in your notes. I wrote them in my Bible. Right where the quote is, I wrote the actual text. I looked them up. Now, I didn't need to do that because the study Bible does give you these in the footnotes, but you have to search for them and find them, and I just wrote them into the text. Four passages of Scripture. Let's listen to Paul and how Paul uses the Old Testament. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That comes from 2 Samuel 22.50. 2 Samuel 22.50. Verse 10. And again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's Deuteronomy 32.43. Deuteronomy 32.43. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. That comes from Psalm 117 and verse 1. Psalm 117 
verse 1. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will all the Gentiles hope. That is Isaiah 11.10. Isaiah 11.10. And then Paul says in verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And so we see from this passage that what's happening here is, is it's a principle called the principle of double fulfillment. The principle, that's, it says that right on your sheet. If you're looking at your sheet in the middle, mm -hmm. underneath Romans 15, the principle of double fulfillment. So what happens, folks, sometimes in the Old Testament, you'll have a prophecy, okay, and it'll be fulfilled in Old Testament times, but it has a future fulfillment in a future leader, and that's what's going on here, okay? The root of Jesse, or the rod of Jesse, sometimes it's referred to, which is David, was the man whom God had raised up in the succession of leaders in Israel, and it would be David's son who would become the Messiah, you say, wait a minute, David's son? Well, yes, because ultimately, in the ultimate fulfillment, in the virgin birth, and in the life of Jesus Christ, if you look at Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you'll see that from the genealogy, that Jesus Christ is in that genealogy from the tribe of Judah and through the ancestry and the line of David. Now, Dan, if you remember, you and I and Mark had a conversation on movie night about Dwight Pentecost. You remember that? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would do me a favor and read that paragraph in the middle of the page, because this is from the principle of double fulfillment by John in Revelation, first century and future, and it's based on Revelation 7, 9, and this is written uh, by... Uh, uh, quoting Dwight Pentecost. Dan? Mm -hmm. Perhaps Dwight Pentecost has stated the case in favor of the double sense principle better than any other. Few laws are more important to observe in the interpretation of prophetic scriptures than the law of double interpretation. Two events widely separated as to the time of their fulfillment may be brought together into the scope of prophecy. Other men who have agreed with Pentecost as to the legitimacy of this principle are Berkeley Nicholson, Bernard Graham, C.L. Feinberg, Charles Riley, and John Walsward. The principle of double fulfillment in interpreting prophecy David Jeremiah. Thank you. And so we see a principle here that um, takes a little bit to understand of how something can be prophesied and fulfilled in the Old Testament and still have a future fulfillment in the New Testament or in the future. And this is an exact case in point. So you have Isaiah 11 that Paul quotes in Romans 15 that ultimately will be fulfilled in the sovereign reign of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. from the Mount of Olives, from Jerusalem, from the city of David in the future. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't ruling today. Of course he is, but he's not ruling in physical form. Mm -hmm. But he will be. And that's where we get into the uh, latter part of Revelation and we're not going to go there tonight, but what I want you to see tonight is how a prophecy from Isaiah, uh, which uh, is about 6th, 7th century B.C., can be used by a um, 
man of God, the Apostle Paul in the first century A.D., pointing to the ultimate fulfillment that is yet to come. And we don't have a date on that because we don't know when that's going to be because no man knoweth the hour, not even the angels. So if we don't know the hour of the rapture, which hasn't happened yet, we certainly don't know the hour of the tribulation, which follows. Consequently, we don't know the hour of the reign of Christ, which, which comes after all of that. So we can see all the way back, we can see a little ways back, we can see present day, and we can see future. Mm -hmm. We can see that whole panoramic scope between Isaiah 11, Romans 15, modern evangelism with Jews for Jesus, with uh, uh, the outpouring of the Spirit in Israel where uh, Messianic Jews are coming to Christ, uh, and Gentiles are... Uh, grafted in, Dan brought that passage up last week from uh, Romans about the Gentiles being grafted in, and that fulfills the promise given to Abraham, if you remember in Genesis 12, where God promised Abraham, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not talking about the Jews, but talking about all the families of the earth. And this is what you're seeing in this passage you're seeing this great multitude of every language, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every geographical location, but these people have come to Christ. And so this is the fruit that was spoken of in Genesis 12 and all the way through the prophetic scriptures. Does that make sense? Do you have questions about that? I looked this up when I when I read this, and I, of course I like to like Pentecost anyway. And, and I, I looked it up because I wanted to see what he had more to say about this. And I looked up a lot of the scriptures, and there is a lot of scriptures that prophesy the birth of the Messiah, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Yep. There is a, a, just a ton of them. Yep. I didn't realize there were so many. And, and yeah, there are. There and I have a list, I don't have it with me, and it's not part of this Bible study, but I have a list uh, somewhere. Here we go, I, ha I do have it, the 40 Messianic prophecies by Jews for Jesus. Here we go, I'm not going to read them all, but a couple. The Messiah would be the seed of a woman, Genesis 3.15. 3, the Messiah would be the descendant of Abraham, through whom all the nations would be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. The Messiah would be a willing sacrifice. Genesis 22, 9 to 10. I got pages and pages yeah. and pages of this. And by the way, anybody wants a copy of this, this I didn't use this in the Bible study so far, uh, but um, I can make copies of this for, for anybody that wants it. And those of you that are at home, you can download this called the 40... Messianic prophecies from Jews for Jesus, and Dan's right. And um, I don't think this is all of them. I think there's more than this, but this is what they put together. Yeah, I got tired of reading. I, you know, I got tired of looking. I'm sorry. I got tired of looking. You got tired of looking. <laughs> your eyeballs started to droop. I was wondering what was the matter with your eyes. Now I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole lot, isn't it? Yeah. It is phenomenal. There's oh. a lot in relationship to his um, crucifixion and, and resurrection in the Old Testament, too. Actually, I learned the plan of salvation where I can lead a person to Christ without even touching the New Testament. I can do the birth, death, life, resurrection of Jesus Christ all from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't something I dreamed up. This I was given this by one scholar, and I don't remember his name, and I don't have it with, but um, there's a ton of passages um, in Isaiah, in, uh, in the Psalms, and in other places uh, in the prophetic Old Testament that, that points to and shows the Messiah. And when I'm witnessing to a Jewish person, I always start with all of that. Never go to the New Testament, not to start. And finally, when they come to the point where they say, well, Craig, you've convinced me, I know there's a Messiah. And I'm looking for him. I'm waiting for him. I'm, I'm longing for him. Can't wait! And I say, good. 
Let me show you where he is. And open up to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And I start with the genealogy. That's important to them. Now, you're a Gentile, so you're thinking, ah, genealogies, what's that? That's not important. Well, I, I think the same thing, because I'm a Gentile too. We don't want to do it the way we think. We want to do it the way they think. And genealogies are critical to them. Very important. So if you can prove from Scripture, not from opinion, but from Scripture, how that Jesus Christ fits and falls in line from not only Genesis 3.15, uh, not only Genesis 12.3, not only all these prophetic passages, and, excuse me, Isaiah and Psalms and Zechariah and other places, but you can show how the historical Jesus because the Jews accept him historically. Mm -hmm. That is, any Jew that accepts their own commish, their own 39 books, they will accept him as a teacher. They will accept him as a historical person. They will say, yes, he did live. But they won't say he's God yeah. until you show them that all of these passages that you help them understand and go through and see in their own commish is fulfilled in Jesus. And uh, it's a fascinating study. Actually, it's a, it's a pamphlet that I had that, um, that talked about that. I haven't seen it for years, but I had it. I'm sure I could find one. Did you have your hand up, Matt? Yeah, I was going to say, one of the reasons why the genealogy is so relevant to them is because it's about the blood, the bloodline. In other words, they place a lot of emphasis on that. You're absolutely right. That it's, it's, you know, people don't realize this, but even in the Old Testament, it's the spirit is in the blood, not the life, the spirit. Very it's, good. That's exactly right. It's an incorrect interpretation. It's the spirit is in the blood, not life. I want to get back to the Bible study and jump uh, down to number nine. That's a good point. Okay, so... Look at verse 9 with me. We're back in Revelation 7, and we're going back to verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. I already talked about that great multitude. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Okay, that's as far as I want to go. So on your sheet it says, all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. John MacArthur has a comment on that I want to read. He says all of the earth's people groups. All of the earth's people groups. That's what he's uh, um, underlining there. And I think that's exactly right. You know, it's not just the Jews. It's not uh, a certain select group of people, but it's talking about everybody everywhere. We're talking about global population here. And so there will be people that are will be in heaven from every nation, from every continent, from every language and every people group, presumably when we get to heaven and see this family of God. And so that's what, what's being here. Now it talks about palm branches. How many of you remember Palm Sunday? Where in the world did Palm Sunday ever come from? As a matter of fact, why in Revelation 7 does it mention palm branches at all? It says that in verse 9, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Take uh, your finger, take one finger and leave it or mark it with Revelation 7 and flip over to Leviticus. And we're going to look at the biblical answer for that question about palm branches. Leviticus 23, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. One of the fascinating things about Bible study is the joy of discovery. And the joy of discovery is that joy when you're searching the scriptures and you're looking up passages and you're comparing this passage with that passage, and then all of a sudden you have one of those ah moments. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit makes it clear in your mind and you, you grasp it, you see it. 
that you had not seen before or had not understood before. And Leviticus 23, 40. Uh, could I have a reader for that one verse? Let's hear it in KJV. Joe, Pastor Joe, would you mind? Leviticus 23, 40. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Okay, so this is a command of God. Okay, this is not something we thought of. This is directly from the command of God. Does anybody here have the ESV study Bible besides me? I know Mark has it, but he's not with us tonight. Anybody? You have it with? I have it in my computer, but I don't have my computer with me. Anymore. Oh, okay. All right. You might want to bring that next time. I will. <laughs> 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 I have a battle between Mario and Luigi or Brother Rocket has it. Oh, I wasn't there. It was the, his the little his one. daughter. <laughs> he didn't win. I didn't win. <laughs> Actually, I chose not to. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the ESV Study Bible footnote, and this is Leviticus 23, 40, 37 to 44. It says, Summary of the Annual Feasts. Judging from verse 38, the appointed feasts in verse 37 refers to the six feasts over and above the weekly Sabbath. You understand that the nation of Israel had a series of feasts that they were commanded to keep. Okay? The purpose of these feasts is to help the people remember the Lord and his work on their behalf and to worship him appropriately. Verses 37 through 38 summarize the festive calendar but verses 39 to 44 re refer to a discussion of the Feast of Booths. These verses may simply be a further elaboration because of the lack of detail and earlier explanation of the festival. So here's what's going on. So, so you know the history of Israel. Most of you know the history of Israel. You know they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. You know they had spiritual victories and they had spiritual defeats. There were times of great spiritual ecstasy, and there were times of great spiritual drudgery due to their responses to the Word of God. And so, the nation of Israel and the history of the nation of Israel is punctuated here and there and here and there with events, that's time, and places. That's mountains or plains or wherever. And to help Israel remember these events, God instituted these feasts. These were mandatory feasts to help remind the Israelites of their salvation history. I'm not going to go into the feast tonight. I could, but that's a separate Bible study all by itself. But all I want you to see is in Revelation 7, when it talks about the palm branches, John is not just talking through his hat here. This is under the inspiration of Scripture, and God is ringing the bell, knocking on the wooden table, calling out, hello, trying to get everybody's attention, palm branches. The Jew who would read this would think, the festivals, mm -hmm. the Feast of Booth, and go back to Leviticus and start to trace it through. Gentiles wouldn't get that right off unless they were really good Bible students and had studied that. Then they're like, oh, I get it. I know what that's about. It's about the feast. But that's not part of their history, but it is part of Israel's history. Jesus has fulfilled or will fulfill all of their feasts and festivals. Indeed, he will. And you know what? That's a good Bible study to do sometime in the future about what the feasts are, what they mean, how they apply to the Christian today, and how Jesus has, is, or will be 
fulfilling each and every one of those people. That's an excellent point. Yeah. That's so true. And that's a beautiful point. And so um, in John's uh, notes, John says, in ancient times, palm branches were associated with celebrations, including the Feast of Tabernacles, which is Leviticus 23.40, and then there's passages Nehemiah 8.17 and John 12.13. We're not going to look up all of those verses, but we are going to look up one of them, John 12, 13. Would you turn there, keep your finger in Revelation 7, and turn to John 12, 13. You know, Pastor Sandy, that would be a real good Bible study guide if there is one, on the feasts of Israel and how they are fulfilled in Christ. That'd be a fantastic Bible study, if that exists. I don't know if it does or not. Since you're, since you're director of discipleship and, and uh, 10 or 15 other things, uh, I, I thought you might have some insight on that. I, I actually had it in Bible college under um, Old Testament survey. Yeah, I did too. And yeah. Pam did too. We had Old Testament survey too. Yeah. But I mean a study guide in 21st century America that we could do there in Sunday one. school Wednesday yeah. night. Or... I have one in my computer. You have in one in your house. computer. Yeah. Is it something that people can buy and use in a class? Yeah. Is they, it? They sell them hard, hard copy. It's, it's produced by, uh, uh, I can tell you the publisher in Louisville after I... Yeah, look that up and let me know later. I, I would love to know that. I would love to look at that. All right, we're in John 12. John chapter 12. And this is not an unfamiliar passage because this is the triumphal entry where Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And we're not going to read all of it, but we'll read verse 13. Susan, would you like to read that for me? Sure. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Thank you. Thank you. And so as they're walking with these palm branches, you know, the Jews would get it. They would make that connection to the feast. They would see that as part of their Old Testament coming into play right then and there. And that's a beautiful uh, passage. All right. So, Leonard, can I ask you a question? What do you think the Jews at that time that were celebrating Jesus coming in on a donkey, and they had the palm leaves out there. What do you think their thoughts were? Well, first of all, I don't see that as a singular. I see that as a, a multitude of levels. Okay, so what did they think? I think they, in, in your question, that's, an, that's a good question. Yeah. I think they, uh, you've got to draw yourself a, um, a vertical list and maybe number it from, I don't know, Let's go one to four for the for the time being. Do that in your head. Draw it. One, two, three, four. So what were they thinking? Well, level one, there could be Jews, and, and I don't know for sure, so this is my guesstimate, but level one, those Jews could be, it's party time. It's celebration time, okay? Anytime you bring out a palm branch, yeah. that's celebration time. Right. That could be level one. Level two could be a little bit deeper. And level two could be where the Jews were thinking, you know what? This is really a significant thing we're doing here. This is really an important thing we're doing here. We need to get these branches out and get them laid out because this was in our scriptures somewhere in our scriptures. I've heard Christians say that, somewhere in our scriptures. And then level three and level four are more serious Bible students, commish students actually of their scriptures, where maybe level three, they really have made that connection in their brain. They really have connected it to Leviticus 23. And level four, if I could arbitrarily say it this way, and this is not out of a, a book, this is just off the cuff, could be Messianic Jews. And these people are the Jews who are seeing Jesus 
as the genuine, as the true, as the actual, and as the literal bodily fulfillment of all of those passages on the Messiah. I told you I'm talking to a Jewish person, and that Jewish person told me that they are waiting for the Messiah, literally. And, you know, this isn't just a, a dream that they have. It, this is something that's, that's real specific to them. I mean, this person is, is as sincere as can be. You know, um, they haven't, this person hasn't come to Christ yet, but this person sincerely believes. This person just doesn't have the whole picture. This person just doesn't have the whole story. This person just doesn't have the whole meaning. But this person is coming in that direction. And so they, being the Jews at the time, I think there could be multiple levels. Now, I just arbitrarily picked one to four. Maybe there are more levels. Maybe there are more um, ways to describe that. But generally, I think that's a general idea. Pastor Sandy? I should know this, but I don't, and I can't go to my Bible right now while I'm doing this. But did the Palm Sunday actually happen on the Feast of Booths? Didn't Palm Sunday did, actually, did it did it actually happen while they were celebrating the Feast of Booths? I don't I don't know that off the top yeah, of my head. I don't know that either off the top of my head. That's a good good point. Yeah. That looked that one because up. that could be a fulfillment right there. It could be. It very well could be. Okay, so let's turn the page. We're at the top of page four, and it says salvation belongs to our God. Uh, at the top of your page, and that's from verse ten. And uh, John says, salvation is the theme of their worship, and they recognize that it comes solely from him. We're in Revelation 7 now. So when I just word the, read the word they, the they in John's description here is not the they in Dan's question and, and discussion, but they being they in this text we're reading. Who is they? Well, they is. Let's read it again. And after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the theme of their worship is salvation. As they are celebrating, as they are um, exalting God as the deliverer, not of the Israelites from the Red Sea as he parted the waters, but delivering the world through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the Lamb of God. Okay, salvation belongs to our God. Now, verses 13 to 17 is the next and the last section. And if I could have a reader for 13 to 17, that would be super. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is in the midst of the throne, will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's Revelation 7, 13 to 17. Okay, so look at your sheet now. I want you to see something I drew for you, made for you to help you grasp this thing, the Great Tribulation. You see that in verse 14? Now, I got two groups of people, and I call these two groups of people pre-rapture converts 
and post-rapture converts. Does everybody understand what those words mean, how that works? Pre-rapture converts, this is the born-again church of yesterday and today, both Jew and Gentile, bond and free. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 helps us to understand that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and in his first letter, in his first letter, <coughs> the Apostle Paul says this. Starting with verse 12. For just as the body of one has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And verse 13. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all who were made to drink of one spirit. So, I call those the pre-rapture converts, and that's us. Mm -hmm. Everybody right here, right now, is part of that first group. That's us. Post-rapture converts, this is the post-church believers of tomorrow, or the future believers. These are the tribulation saints who, by God's sovereign grace, trust Christ during that seven-year period following the rapture. Now, somebody will say to me, so what do you think you are, a theologian? Where do you get off cutting up pre- and post-converts? Where in the world did you ever get such a concept? Well, I'm going to tell you, I got it from Jesus. <laughs> I got it from his prayer. Look at his prayer, John chapter 17. You'll see that right there. It's clear as a bell. John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. And let's read his, some of his prayer. John 17, we're going to look at verses 20 and, verses, and verse 24. I can remember as a new Christian when I first read this, and it was explained to me, I went, wow, really, really? I couldn't believe it. Talk about joy of discovery. It was like a light went off, and I couldn't believe it. John chapter 17 By the way, in the ESV Study Bible, uh, on page 2059, they have this high priestly prayer broken down into four boxes, and it says, The Father gave the Son, and it gives a whole list and verses. The Son gives believers, and it gives a list with verses. The Son asks the Father to, whole list with verses. And Jesus, Jesus' followers and the world, and a whole list, and all the verses, and this is one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. I've never seen anything as good or better than what I'm looking at right now in this Bible. And uh, some of you want to see it, I'll show it to you. Anybody wants copies, I'll make it. Um, really, really good. That's not what I'm doing right now, though. Right now I'm reading John 17 and verse 20. Listen to this. I do not ask for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me. Who is that? That's Craig. Who is that? That's Dan. Who is that? That's Susan. That's all of you. That's all of us. That's the believers of today. Let me read that again. I do not ask for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, and you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So let me go back through this one more time so that you get it. The pre-rapture converts are the born-again church of yesterday, which includes beginning when? The day of the day of Pentecost and everybody since. That's truly, genuinely 
repented and born again, not just religious people, but true, genuine believers, the pre-rapture converts, because the rapture didn't happen yet, and secondly, the post-rapture converts. And these are those that come to the Lord that Jesus Christ prayed for in John 17 that have not even been born yet. The thought is not even in their mothers' and fathers' minds yet to birth them. Because presumably mom and dad aren't born yet either. I pray not for these alone, but for those who will believe in me. And there you have it, folks. Wow. So there's two groups of people. These are present tense, and those are those who will believe, pointing to the future. I think that's fascinating. Verse 14, we're back in John 17, and I have 12 minutes, and we probably will finish this tonight, or we'll come very, very close. So we're looking at John 17, 14, and it talks about, let's go there. And I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. John talks about washed in the, washed their robes, and he says, This is salvation's cleansing is in view. Salvation's cleansing is in view. Washed in the blood, washed their robes. This is pointing to salvation. Let's look at Revelation 19.8. Revelation 19.8. Revelation 19.8 says, well, actually, I'm going to read 6 through 8. Revelation 19, 6 through 8. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is polyester, <laughs> cotton, Silk? No. The righteous deeds of the saints. Okay? And so we see um, that um, this is talking about uh, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Look at um, one more verse. Psalm 51 and verse 7. Psalm 51 and verse 7. Okay? Psalm 51 and verse 7 says... Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, whiter than snow. I have our hymn book here. This is from upstairs. This is the celebration hymnal in our pews. And I have this on your sheet here, and I quoted a song for you right on your sheet at the bottom of page four. And then I looked it up in the hymn book, and here it is. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want you forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Talking about the efficacy and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, that when he saves us, that we are washed perfectly clean, and we are made, we are declared justified, because we are justified by faith, and we live by faith, the blood of the Lamb. Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, Revelation 5 and verse 9. Revelation 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. First Peter chapter 1, 
Look at 1 Peter for a moment. 1 Peter 1 and verse 19 says, beginning with verse 17, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without spot or blemish. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. And so we see the power of the blood of the lamb. We're back in Revelation 7. Look at verse 15. Revelation 7 and verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. I want to talk just a minute about his temple. His temple. Revelation eleven nineteen helps us to understand that. Revelation eleven nineteen says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of the covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashings of lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. John has a thought about that. John MacArthur says, This refers to the heavenly throne of God. During the millennium, and you remember the millennium is the 1,000-year reign of Christ literally on earth, <coughs> that we believe is literal. During the millennium, there will also be a temple on earth, a special place where God dwells in a partially restored but still fallen universe. In the final eternal state, with this new heavens and new earth, there is no temple because God himself will fill all and God himself will be the temple. So when we're talking about the temple, we have a lot of history, the Old Testament history with the temple and the restored temple and all of that, and with the future temple during the millennium. And then as we look into eternity future, it talks about God being that temple. Now go back to Revelation 7 again, which is where we are in verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. That last phrase, will shelter them with his presence, is translated differently in several Bibles. I'm going to read the NASB on that passage because I like the way they did it. But before I do, uh, let me just remind you that... Um, uh, one second. Well, let me read. Let me read the NASB. This is Revelation seven and verse fifteen. NASB. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple, and He who sits on the throne will spread His tabernacle over them. Will spread His tabernacle over them. In, in the ESV, it says, he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Okay, it's a different way of translating it. Um, it's a little bit, um, there's a number of different ways to tra translate that in the Hebrew. But the point is that God is going to make his residence with us. That God is going to protect, God is going to shelter, and God is going to be present in the moment with us. And this is a very faith-building series because the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And as we're studying the scriptures and opening up these passages and realizing what they say and what they mean, not only in the Old Testament, the Inner Testament, the New Testament, but in present modern day life and how God is going to use them in the future in the fulfillment during that time. 
He is going to protect us with his presence. There's one last thing I want to do, and I have three minutes. And before I do it, I'm going to ask for four volunteers for four passages of Scripture. Pam, I'm going to ask you to read John 10, 11 when I ask you. And um, Dan, could you read Hebrews 13, 20? And um, I got two in First Peter. I'll take volunteers for these two. Who'd like to read First Peter 5, 4 when I ask you? I can do one. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. And the second one, 1 Peter 2.25, and Susan has it. So, as they're looking up their scriptures, look at Revelation 7.17 7, in your Bible. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be what? Will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Pastor Joe in KJV uh, for, for the verse 17. How does yours read in the beginning? For the Lamb which is in it, in the uh, midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Shall feed them and lead them. Is that what you said? Shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Feed and lead. Okay, that's shepherding. That's, that's very good. Any other translations have it any differently? Okay, so let's hear these other verses. We see that Jesus Christ uh, is the shepherd from this passage and John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. The great shepherd of the sheep. And 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Chief shepherd. And 1 Peter 2, 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. An overseer of your souls. That's why I put soul shepherd under there. So we see the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, and the soul shepherd who is the overseer of our souls. This is a powerful study. I hope that God is blessing you as much as he is blessing me because although I'm the teacher in this lesson, I'm learning lots and lots of things as we're going along. I got one more passage of scripture I'm going to read and explain, which is not on your sheet. And I wish Mark were here. He might be. Is, is Mark in? I didn't see him on here. Okay. Mark, in two different Bible studies, mentioned this. And we never read it. But we're going to do it now. I apologize. We never read it. Actually, this was from a couple of weeks ago. Look at Exodus 31. Exodus 31. And this will be the last thing we're doing tonight. And if you want to write this in your notes, it goes on page two. Uh, in the middle of the page, it talks about the seal of the living God. And we were talking about sealing today. And we talked about Ephesians 1.13. We talked about Ephesians 4.30, which are not in your notes. You wrote them in there. Uh, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. And, and Mark brought up that the first reference to the Holy Spirit in dwelling in the Old Testament was these two men. And we didn't look at the verses, but we're going to do it now. I'm going to oh, read, I see it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read Exodus 31, mm -hmm. verses 1 and 2. Okay, Susan, would you read that? It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. Continuing to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft. This is the supplies for the building of the tabernacle. The tabernacle. And verse 6 says, And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, 
the son of Ahishma, and of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testim testimony and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils and the pure lampstands with all of its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings with all its utensils and the basin and its stand and the finely worked garments and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his son for the service of the priest and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense of the holy place according to all that I have commanded you they shall do so God called these two men and filled them with the Holy Spirit in order to do the work and by the way if you have uh, an ESV study Bible the tabernacle in its court I'm going to hold this up for the camera. This is a two-page picture, and I'm not sure how much of that you can see, but there's several pages in this Bible, and I'm going to hold it up for everybody to see. If you look up here real quick, you're looking up this way real quick while I'm holding this Bible up. I can't hold it up too long. Mm -hmm. Dolores, did you see this? Yeah, I did see Ever it the first time. This is a, and it's several pages here, and uh, it, talk, it has pictures of the Ark of the Incense, tremendous um, pictures and explanations and uh, here's the tabernacle tent and so forth and so on and so we see the ministry of God beginning with creation all the way through the 21st century America that God is on time and God is on task and he is completing his work and bringing every family every people, every tongue, every nation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we, we learned previously about general revelation that the whole world has been given the knowledge that there is a God, there is a creator God, through, through creation and all the things that we went through, and the special revelation of this book, the Holy Bible, that is our holy book, our library of 66 books, that shows us a faithful, honest, loyal, and true God Almighty. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much.